This is Climate Justice Y'all, a podcast dedicated to lifting up and centering the climate and environmental justice movement in the South. Despite the South being the most biodiverse, diverse, and one of the largest economic engines in the world, we are underfunded and often barred from the decision-making table. Because of that, we decide to pull up a chair and amplify the stories of communities in the South hit the hardest by the climate crisis. We're using good old-fashioned storytelling to shine a spotlight on these Southern leaders from all walks of life, putting in their blood, sweat, and tears to transform the region. The usage of y'all in the title is on purpose. We are honoring our Southern heritage of creativity, resilience, and ingenuity. All right, y'all, it is season two of Climate Justice Y'all. Let's get started. Hey, y'all, I'm your host, Abigail Franks. So Appalachia and the South in general is ground zero for looking at the repercussions and present impacts of unjust economic, social, and environmental systems and policies, with a prime example being the catastrophic floods that hit the region in the summer of 2022. This region is also the perfect opportunity to push for a just transition, to advocate for better and humane infrastructure, and to look for ingenious solutions from these communities that can apply both to the local and federal levels. Today, we are joined by two folks named Adam Hughes and Chauncey O'Dell, who work with, quote, the Community Union, also known as SOCOM, and the Alliance for Appalachia. In this episode, we'll talk about the importance of remembering the past, fighting for justice in the present, and reimagining the future. Climate justice, y'all. It's real. It's here. And it's about time we listen to folks like Adam and Chauncey about the importance of address transition for the South and Appalachia. Thanks. Let's get started with the show. Adam and Chauncey, what y'all are saying about like how some problems like environmental injustice needs to be dealt with on the local and federal level. And that's so important. And it makes me think of these, you know, like massive legislations like the New Deal, Green New Deal, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act just passed Senate. You know, we'll see if it actually goes through the House. Um, But, you know, things like that, it kind of it's all tying together, especially into the theme of this episode, which is reimagining the present and the future. And when it comes to a just transition, Appalachia slash the South is kind of the ground zero for looking at a post fuel, like fossil fuel economy. Um, And I know I'm preaching to the choir when I say that, especially for like single, like single economic, um, there was a better terminology you said, Adam, but like basically having a single economy just isn't sustainable. So can y'all talk more about what a just transition for Appalachia would look like? Yeah. And I know that's a super broad question. So take take it apart as much as you want. Well, here, Abigail, I would actually be interested to hear um, Adam's answer on this because I know that um, he is doing work, um, particularly with the Clear Fork community and different things about, um, yeah, what it, what a jazz transition can look like, essentially um, the creation in in the ashes after the the destruction of um, of yeah what's been left behind. So. I mean, I, I can touch on some thoughts, but I'm really interested to hear what you have to say, Chauncey, as someone <laughs> who, unlike me, grew grew up in Appalachia and is, is thinking through on a day-to-day basis how to do better by your own community and what you want the future of your community to look like. And I think there's power in that that I don't know that I can, can really match. Yeah. Um, we were just talking about how we are experts in our own experiences, Chauncey. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. You all got me. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I'm first. <laughs> yeah, I, I think really thinking and, and dealing with these legacy costs of, of coal is is really important. Thinking through what it has meant um, to have decades of communities being grown in a certain way um, and how do you support the growth of a diversified infrastructure. Like, I think sometimes these conversations start as being kind of how do you grow businesses first or how do you fund entrepreneurship first? And I think one of the things that we continually butt our heads against is the idea that, you know, it's hard to be an entrepreneur in a place with no broadband access, in a place with crumbling road infrastructure, in a place that's had a continuous population decline over decades and decades. And the very first thing is not, how do you help people 
start small businesses, the first thing is how do you invest millions of dollars in these communities that have given so much to update their infrastructure, get every single person a good internet connection, fix every single road and make sure that they're accessible, fix all of your legacy pollution project problems, make sure that every single community gets good water and um, is connected to a good water source, which people in, in communities in Kentucky have been fighting for for decades. And once you have done that infrastructure investment to match the sort of things that communities that haven't had to deal with the legacy costs of coal mining have faced, that's the point where I think you can really give people the ability to become individual entrepreneurs um, on a level footing. I think just one more important point that I would make is that so often this conversation is based around um, how do we help people who have lost their jobs in the mining industry. And I think that's important. I think we need a good just transition for coal miners. But I also want to recognize that coal mining is a very masculine industry traditionally, um, that um, it's it's primarily men who have worked in the mines historically, not not wholly so, but a just transition that focuses only on the miners is leaving out so many people who are not coal miners, leaving out the economies of care that I think what I have seen in the Clear Fork Valley is that so many of the organizations now are, are being led by, by women who have deep community ties and who do not get a lot of support in the same way that we think about, well, how do we help these miners train for other jobs? So really having an approach that, that makes sure everyone is included is so important in the Just Transition conversation. Yeah, and for me, it's um, so stepping into my own uh, lived experience as someone from Appalachia and I did um, I did I did leave the area when I was 18 um, and I um, and I just returned um, a couple of years ago um, just in time for my my 40th so I did um, you know I did leave um, in order to um, get experience or do whatever for jobs, different things. And, um, and coming back and, you know, when I was gone, um, it did become a little bit of a, of a personality thing to, to be like, you know, yeah, I'm from Appalachia and have everybody, you know, tell their jokes and, and do all that stuff real fun. Um, but I, I started to realize like how much it bothered me, you know? And when I, when I've moved back home and just being, um, and I'm, and home for me is, um, the great smoky mountains here. Um, uh, you know, close to, uh, St. Dolly Parton. Um, and, uh, it is, um, you know, there is, there is so much here, the, the, there's so much to, um, be, uh, not only proud of, but just to like, um, be in awe of, um, not only the, the, the beautiful, like natural legacy we have here, but also the, the people in this region. Um, and there is a, um, there's a book that came out in, um, like 2018 um, uh, by a woman named Elizabeth Cat, and it's called What You're Getting Wrong About Appalachia. And I really love that because that gave um, voice and articulation to the um, basically that the, the, the national narrative requires Appalachia to be distressed in a certain way um, and that the people here are somehow um, not capable of even being in ownership of their own legacy of where they are. And um, and something like this pops up in a bunch of different ways. I um, was <clears throat> one of the things, um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of factories around here. There's a lot of corporations or manufacturers that either have um, national headquarters or international headquarters, right? And the um, executives that work for these manufacturers, um, they come in from the outside. They're not local people. And their salaries are at a national level, competitive and national level. But the people that work here, well, their salaries are regional. Well, why is that? Because the CEOs salary in regional, the manager's salary is in regional, just the people that live here who should be excited 
that they're just getting this, even though workers at the same level with the same skill set in another state or another region are earning more. So what's that about? So in, in terms of thinking about like the just transition um, here and yeah, we are ground zero in some ways. And so uh, yeah, let's, let's show them how it's done. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ownership of their own legacy. I want that tattooed on my brain like that. The Southern slash Appalachian urge to unlearn your classism and come back to the region. Right. It, oh, man. Yeah, I go. Honestly, when it comes to like a just transition, and also listeners, for those who don't know, a just transition is essentially like an ideology slash philosophy that ensures the most vulnerable in society, like the workers in Appalachia rather than the CEOs, um, can adapt to the overlapping crises. And that's what a lot of us are trying to solve and figure out now. Um, but let's talk about the elephant in the room when it comes to just transition, and that is the new deal and its impacts and because the new deal you know did help vulnerable people in society like adam was talking about like the miners <laughs> you know like that type um you know it helps some but not all so and also you know the tva does a lot of work in y'all's region too and so can y'all talk about the like can y'all expand on the TVA and like what needs to happen there to ensure a just transition for Appalachia slash like Tennessee, Kentucky area? It's such a difficult question for us, how to deal and interact with the TVA. Um, I think it is such a historically unique and in many ways historically important entity and one that right now can, can give us so many fits in so many ways. Um, I think it's important to to remember that that the TVA has, from its founding, like a lot of the damning, um, took people's property that's never been fully compensated. Plays that have lost that generational wealth because they were never fairly compensated for the property that they lost. Um, of course, like some parts of the New Deal, it at the same time opened up some opportunities for employment for, for Black people in Appalachia while also being found explicitly segregating and explicitly a white supremacist institution that could have done so much more had those blinders been removed. Um, so there's a lot of historic context in the TVA in both ways. I think it's, it's meaningful now at the same time that as we're seeing this massive flooding in Kentucky now, um, that the the flood control TVA initially became was instituted as a flood control project that only later kind of the 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 producing of power and the electrification of the Tennessee Valley was almost a secondary purpose um, and you know we we do need to be grateful in some ways that um, that that exists right now um, I think the TVA as the sole um, federal power, federally owned power producing entity um, has incredible potential right now. I think there are certain things that Congress has done to kind of kneecap that. Um, the, the Bond Financing Act, which said that TVA could no longer get money from the, the federal government, that it had to raise its own revenue, kneecapped the TVA's ability to be a living laboratory for the nation's energy policy. Um, the fact that TVA has a strong debt limit means it needs to function more like a private corporation with a profit motive than an entity that can really lead the charge in developing um, renewables and developing energy efficiency and using its federally owned status to to create a better model that, that other states and other regions can follow. So I think a TVA that's more aligned with its original founding vision while understanding all the ways that that founding vision was flawed um, is one that could better serve us. Um, I do think though that there's more that, that we can expect our federal government to be doing to, to use the TVA. I have to say that this is something that Donald Trump understood to an extent um, 
when um, workers from the IFPTE, the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers, were threatened with outsourcing. Um, first of all, we were trying to support them on the ground because um, TVA was trying to effectively bust their union. But at the same time, um, I think uh, the last administration, the Trump administration, took a very negative tact on this. They uh, viewed the outsourcing as, as a sort of anti-immigrant measure. And they, they thought this was important because they wanted to keep American jobs for Americans, which I think is a nasty framework in any circumstance. But they also acted to, to protect these engineers by Trump coming out and like threatening the CEO of TVA and Trump firing or, or releasing one or two of the TVA board members. And there's no reason why that sort of power couldn't be exercised to do the things that people in the Tennessee Valley need rather than just using it as a cudgel to uh, kind of be negative and, and be xenophobic. Um, so I think there's an incredible opportunity for Joe Biden or any future president to not just view these appointments of the TVA board members as pro forma, but really using it to control the future of the Tennessee Valley's energy policy in a way that would have broad impacts for the rest of the nation as we start doing things in a better way. Yeah, I mean, that's a really, I just learned a whole bunch about the TVA and all that stuff. And, you know, it. at least Trump had the balls to kind of do whatever you know what i mean like obviously trump is screwed up on so many different levels but you know i think recognizing the power that people have is vital especially when it comes to kind of you know getting policy priorities done um and meeting goals and everything and so but that being said like before we completely wrap up i would love to know just a little bit more if that's okay with y'all since y'all are clearly like wealths of knowledge um kind of going back just a little bit, talking about clearly this is a holistic and intersecting issue that like impacts so many different facets of Appalachia, like housing, good paying jobs, rural issues you were talking about, you know, like inter we need proper internet. When it comes to a just transition and also thinking about the existing powers like TVA and stuff, how do other issues intersect with a just transition? And I'll... You know, I'll point this to Chauncey and then Adam, because Chauncey, I would love to know, I would love to know both of your perspectives, but Chauncey, I know you do kind of healing work and everything, and that can intersect in a bunch of different ways too. Oh, sure. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I, um, it, my, my day job is, um, as a therapist and, um, grief support and, and, and sort of during, in the context of, um, doing grief support and things like that, um, is the awareness of, um, the fact that, uh, the work that is required, um, to, yeah, um, build, community that is required to um face um the and we are in the bible belt so i'll use the example to face the goliath um of of uh systemic um oppression and things like that um that one of the, one of the things to keep everybody going is the recognition of the of the and right that there are these the um the uh like adam was talking about the uh you know the not being paid fairly for the land here has the ripple effects of not being able to create generational wealth the ripple effect of well the river property was cheaper plus we need access to cheap water in order to keep whatever the turbines cool or, or whatever work whatever is the reason we're doing next to um <clears throat> the water what ends up happening down the line, um, it can be really overwhelming to realize, well, this didn't happen in a year and it's not changing in a year and um, change is the only constant and we're, and we're, you know, we can lose people along the way, we gain people along the way. How do we stay um, uh, resilient and hopeful um, through this long, um, through this long journey? Um, I, uh, um, I, Sockham recently had their uh, 50th 
anniversary. Um, and one of the things that I found uh, really wonderful about that was um, kind of how uh, having conversations with people uh, that have been at different points in time on some of these fights is a wonderful way to diffuse the intergenerational warfare <laughs> that seems to be happening in terms of um, like, you know, the, the, the shape of these problems changes over the years. And um, while, uh, you know, it can be easy to um, want to blame the, uh, you know, I am a, I guess, elder millennial, so it can be easy to be like, the baby boomers drop the ball. That's not fair. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's not fair. And, um, but as an elder millennial, I certainly take the clarion call that's coming from the Gen Zers and, and the little kids that are like, what are you all doing? <laughs> what are you doing to help? I, this this is happening. So, um, so for me, like working in um, care and grief support is actually, um, I think, uh, really important for the, you know, eternal question of um, how do we create community? How do we build community? And what gets created in the face of the uh, destruction that we cannot control? Yeah, I, I think that's so important. I think viewing the, the kind of compounding crises that we have in Appalachia as as a mental and psychic crisis, as well as just one of material conditions, because those are so linked, is is so important. And and the work that Chauncey does to try to work with people in that situation is is inspiring in so many ways. Um, I think. One of the things when I think about, when we talk about the intersecting issues that, that the climate crisis provokes is housing justice here in Knoxville. Um, Sockham has been working on a project to track um, evictions in Knoxville, which have gone up to like 140, 150, 160 families every single week getting evicted from their house. And that's only the evictions that are actually filed. Um, we started attending housing court um, soon after the pandemic started as that first wave of evictions was happening and then began a canvassing project to try to inform people about their rights under the housing moratorium that led to people staying in their house. We're working on a project right now with students in the UT Geography Department to track every single eviction that's taken place in this county since the beginning of the pandemic. And we're working with the law clinic to try to establish a right to counsel for everyone facing eviction so they would have access to a lawyer. At first glance, this might seem completely separate from some of the issues we're dealing with in mining communities. But to me, it all feels like a part of the same issue. First of all, housing stock in Knoxville is aging right now. We have a very old housing stock um, in part because this region's mono economy for so long has kept a diversified economy, even in Knoxville, from, from being established. I think we're kind of seeing that happen much later in the game. Aging housing stock means things are falling apart. It means you have an unusually high power bill because your house isn't weatherized and you don't necessarily have the money to do that weatherization. So already we're put, seeing families get under the squeeze of high housing costs. And then when you see a huge economic shift, there has been no meaningful just transition attempt for the coal producing communities um, that are kind of north and, and west of Knoxville. And as those communities have started to, people have moved out of them and so many of them have shrunk to a tiny fraction of their original size, a lot of people start moving to the city where they think that there might be more opportunity. So you have these compounding crises of fewer people in communities um, that are rural, putting more and more strain on, on the people who are left and, and creating many fewer opportunities and a huge population growth in the city. And it's not just from people um, in rural communities moving, it's people moving from California and Texas. It's the fact that the University of Tennessee has expanded their enrollment by 14% over the last decade, which in turn means more student housing needs, which push people out. 
all of these factors end up with rapidly rising rents. Knoxville has one of the highest rent increases in the country and a, a crisis where there's no support for families that are getting behind and where landlords are very quick to, to pull the trigger on evictions. Um, and I found this myself um, in the middle of doing this work on the pandemic. I was told by my old landlord that uh, he wanted to remodel and flip the house and that I had a month and a half to get out. So it kind of became a very personal thing to me. But to me, the housing crisis in Knoxville is not just the result of, first of all, racial inequity, of financial inequity here in the city, but it's also an entire region that has not gotten the resources to create the diverse economy to allow people to stay in the communities they're born in if they want to, to allow people the flexibility to remain in their houses. Um, and to me, that's that's a failure of, of just economic transition for the coal fields as well as so many other issues. I mean, that right there just highlights the intersectionality of all these issues. I mean, that was a very succinct way to describe such a huge intersecting problem. And, you know, when it comes down to it, if you can't sleep in a safe place, you can't fight for a better future. If you can't eat good food and healthy food, you can't fight for a better future. And if you can't breathe healthy air and have good paying jobs, it's hard to fight for a better future. Um, and so with all these intense issues that we're dealing with, I would love to, even though I could talk to y'all forever because I've already learned so much, I would love to ground this episode and finish by asking y'all what gives y'all hope despite all of this and what keeps y'all fighting? For me, um, what gives me hope um, is first of all, um, giving myself the permission to work and be in community with people I respect. Um, Adam is one of those people I've had the fortunate experience of um, through the Alliance and through Sockham to um, just meet people that, um, yeah, I just respect beyond belief and that that um, absolutely is part of it. Um, I think um, I uh, quoted Mr. Rogers earlier, but I'll do it again. Um, any situation that's happening, look for the helpers. Um, there's a real gravity to despair. There's a real exhaustion to the relentlessness of this. And so um, it's important to remember that um, as prison abolitionist um, Miriam Kabe says, hope is a discipline. And so I cultivate it every day. Um, and 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 that is that is something that I've had to learn how to do. Um, because it is there and it is, and, and everything we're doing um, is worth fighting for. And um, sometimes it's, it is a day by day, do enough for the day and then pick it up tomorrow. Um, and the, the last note that I do wanna say that I was reflecting on this whole conversation is, you know, sometimes when we're in crisis, we're trying to focus on like, let's stop the free fall, let's stop the active poisoning, let's stop all of that. And in reclamation of the dignity of this region and things like, no, we deserve more than that. We deserve quality of life. It's not just like, don't kill us. It's also like, show some respect. And so I think um, maybe this region also coming to like, not only, um, that um yeah the quality of life is 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 important as all of that so um but uh yeah i'll pass it to adam <laughs> i've really been inspired by the movement for for gender justice right now um i think there's a reason why capitalism has historically been so linked to very limited ways of understanding yourself and your sexuality and why queer and trans people have have been so oppressed. I think once you are are boxed in with the way that you can understand yourself, um, I think it boxes you in in a lot of different ways. And I think that there's a whole generation of people beyond just one generation too, people who've been fighting for decades 
who have done so much to break down the way that we conceive of our most fundamental selves, I think that does lead people to question in a very real way a lot of the structures that confine you beyond just gender identity. I think things look very dark in a lot of ways for, for queer and trans people, particularly in Appalachia right now. Um, and I think that everyone owes their solidarity to, to people who are on the front lines of that fight, because I think it really is um, a revolutionary thing for people to be doing to, to throw off the ways that they have been confined. Um, so I get a lot of hope that even though there's strong pushback now, the fact that people are, are defining new ways of, of living and new ways of identifying themselves leads to a greater justice and greater flexibility in how we can structure a whole society. And then finally, I just want to talk about one project that I think is is really given me a lot of hope, and, and that's the Gainer Solar Array. Um, in 2016, a, a dear friend of mine named Gail Ford, who um, is an, an older woman who lives in Pleasant Hill, Tennessee, um, started, came to me and came to Sockham with the idea that she wanted a community solar array in her small rural Appalachian town. And at the time I remember thinking, well, this is a great idea, but it's gonna be a really huge lift. And I just don't know that that's possible in a place like Pleasant Hill. And of course, um, she proved me wrong over the, the course of, of every time since then. And, and I've gotten to work with her and SACA members throughout um, Cumberland County to, to work with TVA, to work with their local power co-op. And we found a good site for this land. Um, we've talked to scientists from MIT about trying to, to uh, establish like a, a cutting edge battery storage um, technology on this site. And hopefully we are within a few months of actually being able to announce the opening of this solar array um, which would provide three megawatts of power um, developed right at home from the sun in Pleasant Hill. The fact that people have been able to be so dogged in fighting for this against all odds in a place that you wouldn't think would have the infrastructure for a project like this just proves to me that if people in communities across Tennessee and across the world um, are, are given the tools and given the organizing power to get together and are committed come hell or high water, both of which are literal possibilities right now, um, that, that they are going to see a stronger energy future um, and one that is community focused, that they can do it. So I hope when uh, the Gainer Solar Array finally opens. I cannot wait to, to be there and, and to highlight that as a real, one of the most significant victories I've seen in, in my time as an organizer with Sockham.